Hey, hey, this is John Hope Bryant. This is Money and Wealth. The theme of this episode is demystifying money. That's right. Starting with simple terms that no one explains to you, that people expect you just to understand what no one, well, no one has taught you any of this. Things like equity, stock, debt, you know, versus assets versus liabilities, good debt versus bad debt. Uh, is there a difference? Uh, and things like leasing. Why would you do a car lease versus buying the car, purchasing, financing the car? These are, you know, really important concepts that can change your whole life and has changed mine, but no one's taught you any of this stuff. Now, somebody's going to say to you, I was talking to uh, a guy earlier tonight who is in the music business and he bought his real estate for cash. And he's very proud of that. And he should be proud that he was able to do that. So I'm not hating on him for being able to do that. He made the money and he wanted to control his real estate. But the question is, is that the smart thing to do? Well, it's uh, a safe thing to do as long as you can afford to do it. You pay your property taxes and all that stuff, but you're not getting proper leverage on your money. There's not a billionaire in existence that did not use good debt to become a billionaire. All right. So that's another podcast episode for another time. By the way, I'm not encouraging you to go into debt. I'm telling you there's good debt and there's bad debt, uh, just like there's good people and bad people, right? Uh, there's good capitalism and there's bad capitalism. So let me start off by saying there's no shame in, in this game. The only stupid question is the one you don't ask. So I want you to I want you to be committed to asking questions, right, and not being embarrassed. I asked Quincy Jones, who's a big brother and a mentor and a friend, man, how'd you get so smart? He said, John, I'm just nosy as hell. I want to know everything about everything. I want you nosy. This young lady um, approached me and uh, asked me a very wise question, although I think she felt unintelligent when she said it, but I'm so proud of her that she felt comfortable enough around me to ask the question. She uh, She's about 24 at the time that she asked me this question. She was a friend of a friend, is a friend of a friend, and we had spent a little bit of time together, and I guess she felt comfortable enough to ask me in a moment when just she and I were standing uh, together alone, John, what's equity? Like, what's a stock? And I was so proud of her because it's what you don't know that you don't know that's killing you, but you think you know. And everybody around her in her generation probably doesn't know the answer to that either. Young African-American female, not raised in a household uh, that uh, deals with investment. And she wanted to be the first one in her family, I believe, who wanted to break out of that mode and to become an investor. Not just Black Lives Matter, but Black Capitalists Matter. <laughs> Can I get an amen? So I was proud of her. And we sat there and demystified these terms for a minute. So equity literally is, you know, uh, ownership. It is uh, the net value of something. So if you own, I'll make this simple, you own uh, a house and uh, the house is appraised for $200,000 um, and you owe $100,000 on that house um, in hopefully good debt, that house has a net equity of $100,000. You owe the home, the home appraised with an independent appraiser, not your cousin pooking them, not somebody trying to hook you up and do you a favor, an independent appraiser, uh, appraise the house for $200,000. Um, and you have debt of $100,000 in this example. You have net equity of $100,000. That is what you own. That is your net value of net of the debt. Can equity be something other than a house? Yes, you have equity all parts of your life, in all parts of your life. You can't have equity in all parts of your life. 
uh, is a stock, a form of equity. It can be, absolutely. If you own that stock free and clear, and if that stock has some value, well, actually, even if it, it doesn't have any value to the external world, if you bought that stock, you own that stock, you have equity in that company. Now the market will determine whether that equity is, equity is valuable. I'm going off on another tangent. I'm going to do a whole podcast dedicated to just investment. So put that aside for the moment. I'm going to just do a treetop sort of seminar, a master class on these demystifying these these terms uh, so that you have a basic understanding of how to play in this world because it's what you don't know that you don't know that's killing you, but you think you know, and no one taught you. So it's not like you're dumb or you're stupid. No one gave you the memo. That was my, uh, I think my fifth book. Um, and this goes back to the Freedmen's Bank of 1865. Abraham Lincoln created a bank to teach freed slaves about money, and he was assassinated the next month. No one ever taught you about money. No one taught you how this free enterprise system works, right? So how would you know the rules of this game unless somebody takes time to teach you? And you're smart. And as soon as you get the memo, you'll use it and you'll amplify it. So let's break this stuff down. Um, there's... Uh, there are assets and their liabilities, right? And then good debt and bad debt, right? And then I'm going to deal with one last piece in this podcast on leasing. When to do it, when not to do it. Get all your folks around the mic, around the microphone, around the headphones, around the kitchen table, around the you know, around the barbecue, get your posse together. Uh, get your book club book club together, your hopefully your one someday your investment club together. Get your girls together. Get your boys together. Uh, let's have a weekly conversation. This is my ministry of finance. This is my pulpit right? every Thursday, breaking this down for you in a simple, uh, explainable way, not using 20 words when two will do. I've been here before. I'm telling you stuff that I would want to. I would have wanted to have known and unfortunately, in most cases, learned the hard way, messing up toe up from the flow up, losing a lot of money, uh, and uh, sometimes being just taken advantage of, just being pumped. All right. So here you go. Um, assets versus liabilities. Well, first of all, your assets cannot be on your, <laughs> you figure that out in your, this is radio, so there's only so much I'm, I, and I don't know the age of people watching this. I want this to be family friendly. So you, you'll figure that out. But your assets cannot be worn on your body. Uh, well, they can be worn in your body, but that's not typically where you're going to find your assets, all right? Um, are clothes assets? I, I guess um, you value them. They they look good on you, but that's not a traditional asset. It's something you own, all right? So that's not really what we're talking about here, but a lot of people think that clothes are assets, and they use bad debt to finance non-assets, which makes a bad situation worse. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the, so, so, so what are, what are some examples of assets? Home ownership is an example of an asset. Uh, people say wrongly, oh, I don't own that home. The bank does. Why am I paying on that home? Well, you only not own the home. You only do not own the home if you don't pay the bill then yes, the bank can foreclose on you and the bank will own the home, as it should be, I might say. You don't pay me, I'm going to own your home <laughs> if I uh, loan you money, right? And, the, and if you loan somebody some money in your family to buy a home and they don't pay you back, you want your money back. No need to get emotional about stuff like this. It's just business. And if the bank loans you money and you beg the bank or ask the bank to loan you money and you got it on good terms, you went through Operation Help's credit counseling program, you got your credit score up, got your debt down, your savings up, got you pre-qualified for a prime loan, you got that loan, and a year or two down the road, your situation changes, you screwed up, you didn't call the lender, they foreclosed, don't curse the lender out, right? The lender's doing their job, right? And 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 don't don't get don't get an attitude when they want the the, the, the house back and start calling them a bunch of names. The reality is it just didn't work out. It's an experiment that didn't work out. And when your outflow exceeds your inflow, then your overhead will be your downfall. Uh, and, and be thankful the lender gave you access to credit 
um, explain what your situation is, try to find an orderly way to get the house back to them. Uh, and hopefully you sustain that relationship because relationship really is a, it is a form of capital relationship capital. It is in my opinion, in my life, an asset. Uh, and you can go back to that bank at another time and try again. So home ownership is the easiest way to build wealth, in my opinion, uh, home ownership. So home ownership is an asset. Family is an asset. Uh, now this is a non-traditional asset. Uh, and I'm going to do a whole piece on marriage. But if you're in a relationship and two plus two does not equal six, eight, or 10, then you're probably in the wrong relationship. You should be better together. Your children are assets, not traditional assets. You're not, you're not going to get a loan on your children, but you're investing in them and hopefully that investment's going to pay off. Now, are kids also a liability? Yes, they are, actually. This is one of the situations where a child can be a liability and an asset. They're probably a physical liability until they're 18 that you're literally liable for them. They are, they are literally a liability and they're spiritually an asset. Now, you say, well, John, stop messing around. Give me some stuff that's real that I can put my hands on. Okay, stand, stand by. Home ownership, we talked about that. Family, we talked about that. And I mean, if you don't see your family, your mate as an asset, you need to reevaluate who's your mate, <laughs> right? Um, if you don't, re if you don't think your children are growing up to be assets, you need to reevaluate how you're raising your children and how your children are responding to your family rearing experience. That's a conversation between you and them, but you need to evaluate that on, on the regular. Uh, I'd rather you respect me and learn to like me than like me and never respect me in other podcast for another time. Bonds, investments, stocks. Um, these are uh, assets. Uh, business ownership. This is an asset. I'm giving you five examples. Uh, here's one that's accessible to everybody. Education is an asset. Uh, literally, uh, the more education you get, the better you do in your life if you apply it. Um, you earn seven figures uh, more having a college education than you will having a high school education over the course of your life. It's always better to be more educated. I'm obsessed with education. I think we need to make, make smart sexy again. And you need to shove as much education down your throat as you can manage. Um, it is a buffer against poverty. Uh, education is the ultimate poverty eradication project. Uh, you cannot get enough of it. So here are five easy assets. I could probably list 25, but I gave you five to start. Here are five liabilities. I've already mentioned your kids. That's a literal liability until they are of legal age. Uh, you, they, are, they, are, they are literally reliant upon you. And, the, and, and also the, the government uh, says that they are a liability of yours. You can write them off literally on your taxes. Um, and, uh, and what they do is on your dime uh, in your responsibility. Cars, most cars are a liability. They are a depreciating asset. So uh, you have appreciating assets and you have depreciating assets. Um, and I'll get to this in a minute really deeply in the debt conversation. A car is typically a depreciating asset. Um, credit cards uh, are liabilities. That's not cash. <laughs> Okay. When I was growing up, uh, you know, the joke was, I can't be broke. I still have checks left. Uh, these days, we used to float checks back in the day. Don't act, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. If you're my age, you know what I'm talking about. You wrote that check and you, and you maybe forgot accidentally, intentionally, not to put a stamp on the envelope. I've said this before. And, and, but you can tell it the 1-800 number. I sent the check. I sent the bill in and wait for them to a snail's mail for them to receive uh, the payment and process it and all that stuff. It maybe bought you a week to 10 days to get the cash, to put it in the bank before the check cleared. Today, things are digital. Money's digital. It, 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 things are almost instantaneous. So people think that, but the and, and before the checks, you had cash. And, uh, you know, when you're paying in cash, you know that money's leaving your hands, right? I remember giving somebody a tip earlier tonight for 20 bucks. I remember, um, but I don't remember the last time I swiped 20 bucks when I went to the paper parking. 
I don't remember that. I remember that cash I gave, right? So young people are not, are, are not are, it's not emotional. It's not, it doesn't tug on you. you people actually think that credit cards is, is cash. It's not. People say, you know, don't, most people don't have $40 for an unplanned event. This reporter was like, no, John, you're wrong. People have credit cards. Again, hello, that's not your money. Uh, so you have credit cards. That's a liability. Charge cards are a liability. Charge cards are different from credit cards. Charge card, like an American Express, you can charge on it. You got to pay it in 30 days. Credit card, you can pay it over a term. You have department store cards. These are almost the biggest ripoff um, because many of them are hitting, they're really beautiful, shiny, whatever. They're hitting 26, 28% interest rate. My God, it's like nosebleed stuff. And and and, I, and by the way, I used to have these these cards. I used to have char, uh, department store cards. It's the only way I could finance my business when I was coming up. I had, I had a Pet Boys card for my auto repairs. I had a Sears card. Yes, I'm dating myself for clothes. I had um, uh, a Macy's card. I had a, I mean, I, I had these cre- different credit cards, I had a secure credit card. And that was my capital that, because I didn't have uh, a trust fund. I didn't have financial, I didn't have, no, I didn't have inheritance. So I had to, you know, I, I, I had to make do with what I had. Been doing so middle, some black folks have been doing so much with so little for so long. We can almost do anything with nothing. There's no shame in that game. Lots of pride, but then we have to graduate uh, to new ways of doing things. Let's now talk about, so I listed five assets as examples and five liabilities as examples. These are easy ones, right? Um, And uh, let me now talk about good debt and bad debt. Um, Is there such a thing? Absolutely. (laughs) Just like there's good capitalism and bad capitalism. So good capitalism is where I do, where I benefit and you benefit more. Bad capitalism is where I benefit and you pay a price for it. So slavery was bad capitalism, all right? Um, Robbing somebody and then selling what you robbed is bad capitalism. Um, Creating a comb as an entrepreneur, creating a comb to, 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 to manage hair, nappy hair, okay, or tough hair, uh, and somebody paying you for the value of that, so it costs you $2 to make it, you're selling it for $10, um, you're making a profit, minus manufacturing of $2, whatever your profit margin is, and somebody buying that finds that valuable for them, is worth $100 for them to, to maybe invaluable for them to comb their hair. So fair exchange is no robbery, to quote my friend Rod McGrew, fair exchange is no robbery. I did it. I benefit. You benefited more. Good debt and bad debt. Now, listen to me. Please write this down. Good debt is tied to a asset that might appreciate. Bad debt is financing an asset that will depreciate. Will certainly depreciate. Stupid assets that you finance with bad debt are stupid things that people finance with bad debt are things like jewelry. (laughs) And I don't mean a symbolic thing like an engagement ring or a wedding ring. I don't mean something where you're saving your money up, but you just can't uh, accumulate enough cash for that special moment. You want to get married. You want to get engaged. uh, Something that'll last forever. This is actually an emotional asset. This is that family thing I talked about earlier. See, we're tying this all together. So you might have, in this example, an example where you're financing a depreciating asset, but because it's tied to what you're building, your family, it's actually a spiritual asset that makes it worthwhile for you and maybe gives you more energy to go out there and conquer in the world. So I'm not hating on your decisions. I'm just explaining it. When you buy jewelry, most jewelry, right, I don't care where you buy it from, the likelihood is it will depreciate in value. It will go down. Financing a car is a depreciating asset. Okay, so John, this you 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 make not making any sense now. You're saying that you're calling a car a depreciating asset, and you own cars, John. What's the thing? You know, you're not. You know, are you? Do you own your car, car cash? Well, I own some cars or cash, but I like to finance cars. It's a good use of um, my cash to keep it in my pocket and pay a lender. Uh, for the use of that automobile while I own it, all right? Time use of money. But that car is making me money, allowing me to build wealth. It's taking me to a meeting. Hello. It's taking me uh, 
to uh, a conference. It's taking me to my office. So it's facilitating um, a money-making or wealth-building activity. So it is not the asset, but is a gateway to an asset, in, that, in which case, that's me, <laughs> right? And it's allowing me to go and flow. But I understand uh, when I buy that car that it's going to go down uh, in value. Now, I just had an experience where um, I bought a car and kept it for a couple years, drove it, and sold it. Uh, it was a, a, a exotic automobile. Um, a rare one, not a rare one, but a highly prized brand. And I actually made a profit on that car. Um, I didn't buy it to make a profit. It just so happens I did. Uh, and then I took the profits of that car and another car I sold that, that lost value. I actually thought the car that lost value would sell for more. I thought the car the car that that sold for more would sell for less. It was actually the opposite of what I thought, but the, they canceled out each other. The one I lost value on was washed out by the one I made money on, and I was able to purchase uh, replacement vehicles that were newer without harming my cash flow because I have good credit score, and I got and I was able to take the the proceeds from the sale and buy down the balance on the 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 the, the new purchases, and I was able to get warranties for the new cars. I did not have warranties for the old cars. There was a lot of reasons why upgrading was right. Time is a non-emotional decision. I didn't say, oh, I'm not selling this car. I'm emotionally connected to it. Whatever you make it a, an emotional decision is going to be a bad decision. Please listen to me. Whenever you make an emotional decision, it's going to be a bad decision. People are financing um, sports tickets. Eh, eh, eh. <laughs> not. There's pay, you know, how are these, how are, you hear about these folks, middle class folks paying $2,000, $5,000, $800 for a single ticket to a game. What are you thinking? How are they doing it? Debt. They're financing it and paying for that over time. And, and most people get paymentized. They ask, well, just, they ask, what's the payment? Never ask what the payment is when there's an interest rate attached. Never ask what just the payment is when there's an interest rate in terms attached. You want to know how much are you paying for the for that momentary value of going to that game? And that game is going to come, it's going to go, it's going to be two, three, four hours. You're going to, you know, have that experience, and it's done, right? Like going to Las Vegas, it's done. And, and do you want to be paying for that for the next five years? Because that's the likelihood. And I've, I've had, I, I know folks who finance a, her, uh, I don't, I'm sorry, a car rental. I didn't want to mention the name. A, a, a single car, and I'm not picking on a company, a single car rental. People are financing that. People are financing, again, game tickets. They're financing vacations. Oh, my God. You go to a vacation, may not even like the person you went on the vacation with, you have an argument, whatever it is, you end up coming in a, in a, in a funk, and, you've, and you have financed this whole thing. I'm going to pay for that for the next two, three, four, five years. If you're paying for $1,000, but you're, but you're, but you're financing $1,000, but you're spending four to $5,000 to uh, – finance it over time or even double that to 2000 or 2500 aren't you offended so uh, just you know i'm not telling you what to do i'm explaining i'm saying you want to finance appreciating appreciating assets not depreciating assets things like a mortgage a good mortgage a prime mortgage operation hope can help show you how to do that for a home uh like buying a business or starting a business I, you know like i believe okay i don't mind financing an education i prefer if you didn't but i don't mind it because it will pay a dividend it's a return on assets because as i said earlier if you get a college education in not in basket weaving or you know, some miscellaneous thing uh i mean something that has gainful employment tied to it a career path uh and uh, specificity of uh, return on investment. In other words, there are people, if you get a computer engineering degree, you know, if you want to make sure you never go broke, get an engineering degree on anything, computer engin engineering, mechanical engineering, I mean, any kind of engineering, you will have a job for life, right? Uh, and be gainfully employed is my guess. Um, and so that education, going to get an engineering degree, 
will in all likelihood return provide a, a return uh, that is unequal to most anything else uh, that you do uh, with the same amount of money that you'd make an investment on. So uh, I've given you an example of assets and liabilities. I've given you examples of good debt and bad debt. Bad debt, again, is financing a depreciating asset, financing shoes, financing clothes. They will depreciate. Uh, before you walk, you know, financing a car, before you leave the car lot, you've lost 10%. If you if you finance that car, leave the lot, drive down the street, turn back around, come back, sell the car back to the dealership, they will buy it for ten percent less than you just bought it for an hour before. I'm going to do a whole podcast just on the automotive industry. I'm going to break down a lot of different industries and show you how this stuff works, how these businesses actually make their money, how are they in business, and how does the economics work. And if you have a topic that you want me to talk about, just you know, leave a note, leave a comment uh, wherever you find me on social media uh, or the podcast, and me and my team will uh, will float those up to be included either in me answering a question or as a topic uh, in the actual podcast. So uh, up, uh, depreciating assets uh, are things that will go down uh, are likely not likely to go back down in value. They will go down in value. They many of them have no value at the time that you're financing them. <laughs> Do you know that like jewelry? I was picking on jewelry earlier, but why? Because this the markup on that is uh, is it, it's just crazy. Uh, you're not just buying precious jewels, and then they, and there's different types of diamonds and different types of metals and they mix metals and all. You can't outsmart a jeweler, and and it's sparkly and it's, it's got your eyes. Twinkling, twinkling and oh my god you're you're gotten all emotional about the thing and i mean you, you just can't win or you just can't win do you know that las vegas keeps getting bigger if you notice that you can't win against the house the house always wins jury maker will always win you buy something for a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars of jewelry you financing it you go and sell that same thousand dollar whatever it is ring necklace if you can get 250 or 500 dollars for it uh, in the future call yourself lucky and the financing cost is going to go up while the value will go down, meaning because you're going to finance it and then you own interest, uh, which is compounding on that. Okay, now let me talk about one last thing, which is uh, car leasing, auto leasing. Um, no one explains this to anybody. Like, you know, it, it, here's the basics. If you're, if again, if you have a depreciating asset, um, uh, then you probably want to lease it. Uh, if you have an appreciating asset, then you don't mind uh, financing it. By the way, th that's not a great example. But if you're buying high-end vehicles, uh, this example, uh, brand new high-end vehicles, and you're not going to keep it for a long time, uh, th these are people now. I'm listening, listening to pe people listening now who make six figures now, and you like high-end vehicles, um, and you have a business that you can write the business, the vehicle off to, then you you are a prime target to lease because uh, you're going to roll that car. You're going to keep it for, uh, unlike somebody who buys a car and may keep it for three, five, eight years, you're going to probably keep that car you lease, um, in this example, for 18 months, 24 months, and then you're going to roll that into another car um, and into another lease, is my example, in, 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 all, in all likelihood. Well, you the way they finance uh, and, and you're going to get, you, you're able to write off, if you do it properly, the cost of a lease where you cannot write off the cost of a purchase, at least not easily. Uh, there are other benefits. It's, it's leasing is just designed for business people more easily. And the payments on a lease are going to be less than a payment if you finance the car. Here's why. Take a, and now this is for any car now. You take a car that costs $100,000. Um, I'm just rounding this up. Maybe the car is $50,000. Maybe it's $10,000. It doesn't matter. But let's say just for round numbers, it's a $100,000 car and the financing company that's behind the leasing company, because oftentimes behind a leasing company is a bank or a financier, right? So you're dealing with XYZ leasing company, but there's a financing vehicle behind that. And they have underwritten, they have measured the risk of not only you as a borrower, but the underlying asset the vehicle. They have come to the conclusion that that car that you're buying for 100000 in three years, which is the term of your lease, will be worth, in this example, 
$50,000. So it'll be worth half. You're now going to ha have a lease payment over three years that is that's going to spread out the $50,000 of lost value in those three years. You're going to spread that out on, over pay on payments. Let me give you a better example where it makes more sense. If you're, again, this is, uh, this is mostly applies to high-end vehicles, but um, if you're buying a Ferrari or you're buying whatever, I'm just, again, I'm not telling you to buy these cars. I'm just giving you a real clear example. And you're buying a Ferrari for, you know, $250,000, whatever the number is, right? And the residual value of that car, that car is projected to hold its value. The residual value of that car in three to five years is projected to be, you know, $175,000 to $200,000. Let's say $175,000. Uh, you're buying it for $250,000. You, so you're going to lose $75,000 of value over five years in that lease. This is a good deal for you because now you just have payments that are spread out over the term of that lease, three to five years on that $75,000 versus the whole $250,000. And you have a balloon payment at the end of the lease where you can pick up or you can buy the car for the remaining balance plus any fees you owe as long as you've maintained the terms of the lease. Now, you're renting that car with the lease where you're buy when you buy the car, as long as you, again, no different than a mortgage, as long as you adhere to the terms with your lender, you own that car. So if you own the, if you're leasing the car, you got to check with the owner, the leasing company, before you make some moves about the car. You can't send that car to Peru or, or Africa or someplace. But if you finance that car, you, you own that car, uh, as long as you make those payments, you own the equity of the car minus the debt. And within reason, unless there's some restrictive covenants in the loan agreement, a covenant is an agreement within the agreement, unless there's a restrictive covenant in the loan agreement, you can do as you like. Okay, I hope that that was, that, that confused me. <laughs> I hope that that was, uh, was, was somewhat clear. I just unpacked the magic of leasing recently because I was considering doing a lease myself for something, a car lease myself. I found a lot of benefits to it. Um, uh, you got to check with the ta your tax pro for yourself. But I found a lot of business benefits to, to auto leasing uh, for my business. Uh, uh, but I decided in the example uh, that I was looking at not to lease it did not make sense for me. But I went through all the numbers. I would have had a, a slightly lower uh, monthly payment, but I'd have the the terms of the agreement just were not economically fee it wasn't all that attractive in the long run and they put a lot of restrictions on what i could do with the car and i mean look they own it and in an example i don't and i'm a control freak <laughs> and i i want to own my stuff and do as i like right so i decided i'd rather put money down and buy the car uh so i have equity in the car and i'll own the car in a short period of time uh, as long as I keep the terms, which I will. Okay, so I hope this has been uh, good for you, uh, demystifying some terms that maybe you thought about and were curious about, but too embarrassed to ask somebody. People don't want to admit they don't know what the heck's in the Wall Street Journal. They have no idea what all these terms mean. They're afraid to ask somebody what the FDIC means, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission. They, all these the OCC, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which regulates all national banks, uh, uh, all these different terms, the Federal Reserve System versus the Federal Reserve Banks. There are 12 Federal Reserve Banks in the country, uh, in different regions of the country, uh, because it, in the old world, we used to use move, move money and even gold around anyway. And that's, you know, they now it sets monetary policy and does some other things. Uh, it is very important. But you have the Federal Reserve Board uh, system in Washington D.C., which has a board of governors. So you, the Federal Reserve Chairman, is who you 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 listen to, who sets interest rates, uh, aided by the Vice Chairman and Vice Chair women of the board and the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, uh, which are voting members uh, on the Fed system that, that sets interest rates. So you hear about the Fed, you hear from the Fed Chairman, but there's a board that votes. On all that stuff, you just don't hear from the different Federal Reserve Board of Governor members so often. And then you have Federal Reserve banks uh, and bank presidents around the country, all of which are ballers. They're very, very powerful. Um, and that's the government. But these are terms 
I can go on forever with all these different terms that nobody explains to you uh, that I'm going to, over time, demystify. Okay, I'm tired of hearing myself talk. This is John O'Brien. I hope you found this valuable. Tell your friends to subscribe, to follow. Uh, let's start a conversation. Uh, let's unpack all of this mystery and replace it with knowledge and insight. Let's make smart sexy again. We've been making dumb sexy for way too long. We've dumbed down and celebrated. It is time to make smart sexy again. John O'Brien, this is Money and Wealth. I'm out.